you so much. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction, David. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Now, uh, both uh, Karen and David have actually covered a lot of ground, uh, and we live in a time of limited attention spans, so I'll just give you the TikTok version of my talk. Uh, is globalization over? No, uh, but it is changing. Thank you very much, have a good night. Uh, <laughs> It, it is, of course, more complicated than that. Um, but in some ways, that really is the appropriate answer. I mean, we've had an incredible shock to our faith in our global system of trade. We have come through, or are still in, uh, a pandemic where frontline medical workers didn't have PPE while they were going to treat patients. Uh, we've had the miracle of life-saving vaccines uh, get marshaled in record time, but we've had tremendous inequality in who got access to those vaccines with a lot of nationalism and the profit motive uh, determining that. We ran out of toilet paper. That was amazing. Uh, that certainly changed our view uh, of the system that we're living in. So clearly, something is very different than we expected it to be. Uh, and I wanna talk uh, fairly briefly about how we got into this shock uh, and where we're headed. So last spring, I went to go visit the River Rouge plant. This was Henry Ford's uh, great, uh, most ambitious factory uh, on the River Rouge near Detroit. And you know, we know Ford famously as a pioneer in terms of mass assembly and the use of the assembly line. I was interested in understanding Ford in terms of his contribution to what we now call the global supply chain. Uh, and let me stipulate, by the way, uh, Henry Ford was a terrible person. He was a racist. He was an inveterate anti-Semite. He used uh, lethal force to crush a nascent labor movement. We should not be holding Henry Ford up as a contemporary hero, but all of that said, Henry Ford understood some important and enduring things that are worthy of some reflection right now. He, he knew, for instance, that workers and consumers are the same people and that workers had to be paid enough to afford the products they were making for the consumer economy to function. And he knew that you had to pay people enough to motivate them to do their best work, to innovate. Uh, he doubled pay for his workers and uh, was accused of being a communist, uh, was accused of being a traitor by the rest of the business world. But he did not have to explain why there were labor shortages in his time, and he was able to produce as many cars as he desired. He knew above all else that he never wanted to be in a position where he could, as he put it, be pinched by his suppliers. Uh, and this uh, was something uh, that was threatened by something else that he knew, that shareholders and investors were potentially the enemies of what we would now call resilience, you know, prudent management of his operations. That the investor class would demand short-term gains, short-term rewards that would come at the expense of doing right by uh, building out a business along responsible lines. Th this knowledge was very much hard-earned. In, in 1916, the Dodge brothers, who were some of Ford's uh, earliest investors, took note of the tremendous success of the Model T. They saw that Henry Ford had about $16 million of cash on his balance sheet and said, we would like some of that. It's time to pay us dividends. And Ford uh, was much more interested in pursuing self-sufficiency through the, the creation of, of the River Rouge factory. This is how he put it in his memoir. We aim to make some of every part so that we cannot be caught in any market emergency or be crippled by some outside manufacturer being unable to fill his orders. And he was especially alarmed by the run up in the price of glass to what he called outrageously high levels during World War I. We are among the largest users of glass in the country. Now we are putting up our own glass factory. So the Dodge brothers were threatening his ability to do this. They sued, uh, they won, uh, and Ford had to pay out the dividends that we did manage to build the Highland Park, uh, I'm sorry, the River Rouge factory. 
But, you know, as I stood there more than a century later looking down from a catwalk at this factory at the amazing process of assembling Ford's now most popular vehicle, this is the F-150 pickup truck, it was hard to shake the sense that not only had the Dodge Brothers won, but so had shareholder interests writ large. And, and they'd set in motion a mode of business that was really tailored more to the interests of investors than anyone else, and that this element had really threatened the virtues of the global supply chain, of our innovative economies, uh, of the global trading system. And of course, what I'm talking about is the chips. There weren't any chips. I was watching them make these trucks and they couldn't finish them because uh, they were dependent, like the rest of the modern economy, on chips that were produced, and this would have killed Henry Ford, uh, on this small island, less than 100 miles off the coast uh, of mainland China, an island claimed as an inseparable part of China by Beijing. Not a good setup. Henry Ford would not have liked uh, being in that position. Uh, and it was really ironic to watch them take these uh, otherwise finished pickup trucks and deposit them in a parking lot in the shadow of Ford's giant corporate headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan, and in fact, across the street from the Henry Ford Elementary School. That was just amazing. Um, that's the kind of story that we've heard from people who tell us that globalization is over. And, and the material for that observation is you know, abundant. Uh, Trump, of course, launched the trade war against China. Uh, Biden, we can get into this, has really expanded on it and intensified it. We now are in a moment of what feels like the beginning of a real uh, enduring Cold War with China. Uh, the war, uh, Russia's attack on, on Ukraine uh, and the discovery that uh, much of Africa and South Asia is dependent upon grain harvested in Russia and Ukraine, combined with the threat to uh, Europe's energy supply. You know, these are all serious shocks to the system. And of course, these incredible floating traffic jams off of ports, which explain a lot of the shortages uh, and the price increases that we've experienced with shipping containers, you know, stuck for sometimes weeks, sometimes even months, waiting for uh, the chance for the container vessel to pull up to the dock in Los Angeles or Long Beach or Savannah. You know, all of these things have reinforced that something uh, has really gone awry and that the global economy is undergoing profound changes. But the idea that globalization is over is just simply nonsense. What's happened really is that the kind of globalization we've all gotten accustomed to, where China is the center of the universe, the place where we make everything, uh, has, that has broken down. And we are now in a new era where China has gone from uh, the, I mean, China will continue to be the dominant supplier of all sorts of things for the simple reason that China uh, has supply chains that will take years and years to replicate anywhere else. Uh, but uh, there is now a moment where multinational companies that have relied on China heavily are looking for alternatives. We will we'll get into the implications of that uh, later on. But let's just say good riddance to that order uh, because it, it, it's a, well. Thank you for that. It has not. Uh, it has not worked out uh, along the lines uh, of those who told us that this was great, not only for consumers and shareholders, uh, but for society. Um, I want to pause, though, and make sure that we don't celebrate the end of China-centric globalization as a moment to celebrate the monkey wrenching of trade, because there are many people better placed than I who will speak later at this conference who will properly sing the praises of trade. Trade is not our enemy. Trade is our friend. Trade ha has, in fact, brought about uh, tremendous increases in the standard of living around the globe, has brought us tremendous consumer uh, choices, has tended to boost wages if you're lucky enough to work at a company uh, that exports. The problem is how we have distributed the bounty of trade. Uh, and th there is, this is another conversation, but uh, I'd be remiss to not say, I, I actually don't uh, have a lot of patience for the obsession with China as uh, the uh, supposed source of all of our problems. Uh, our problems in this country are our failure 
to deal with the inevitable losers of trade. There will be winners, the winners are diffuse, they're everywhere, there are people who buy stuff cheap. The losers, we can see them in deindustrialized towns, and we have abandoned these people in this country. Uh, and uh, honestly, in many advanced economies, in including the UK, we have not done what we promised to do, uh, which was train people for uh, more productive lines of work, to help people with healthcare and housing. Uh, we've made, uh, we've set up a system in, in, in in which if you win, you win big, and if you lose, uh, it's a, a pretty steep uh, way down. And, and the result of that is the poisoning of our faith in elites, the poisoning of our faith in basic facts, uh, the poisoning of our, of our basic democratic discourse. But that's about decisions primarily that have been made in Washington, in boardrooms, in New York, in Seattle, and not, not in, in Beijing, um, though China is, is a problem that we, we, we need to focus on and challenge. Part of the reason why trade has generated such cynicism in our own country, and particularly around China, is because of the cynical way in which uh, the terms of China's engagement was sold to the populace, and I come back to the point I was making about Ford, to, for the, the sustenance of the investor class. I mean, let, let's recall, uh, just to focus on one uh, case uh, study of, of craven cynicism, uh, the role that Bill Clinton played in bringing China into the WTO. Bill Clinton in 1992, as a candidate, runs against George H.W. Bush, accuses Bush of coddling the butchers of Beijing for normalizing relations following the massacre around Tiananmen Square. He warns Chinese leaders, observe human rights in the future, open your society, recognize the legitimacy of those kids that were carrying the Statue of Liberty. Not even a decade later, in 1998, Bill Clinton goes to Beijing with Hillary Rodham Clinton, attends a banquet with Jiang Zemin and his wife at the Great Hall of the People, literally across the street from Tiananmen Square. And he not only toasts and talks about the great promise of China entering WTO, he walks to the back of the banquet hall and he mugs for the cameras with the orchestra providing the entertainment for that night. And then he picks up the baton and he conducts the People's Liberation Army Orchestra. I'm not making this up. You can check this out. There are not many people know that story. Um, and then before Congress votes on admitting China to the WTO, Clinton says, by joining the WTO, China is not simply agreeing to import more of our products. It's agreeing to import one of democracy's most cherished values, economic freedom. The genie of freedom will not go back into the bottle. Well, you may have noticed that the story has not played out exactly that way. And, and while it is true that there were legitimate reasons to imagine that engagement with China would uh, produce a middle class that would crave uh, not only consumer goods and experiences traveling the world, but things that we all take for granted, like the right to say what we want and to get good information in our journalism uh, and to uh, absorb art and other experiences critically, uh, it is also true, you know, I was in China just after China uh, entered the WTO, I was based there for six years, that that sounded like nonsense at the time. And it, it sounded like nonsense because China's WTO entry was always about helping the shareholder, the investor class, about dropping the costs of production, about getting out from under unions and labor power in general, making stuff cheaper. And yes, the consumers benefited from that, but mostly the investors benefited from that. And, and the fact that uh, that has all now uh, been revealed uh, is part of the reason why we have this crisis of loss of faith, not only in trade, but in elites in general. People may be wrong to uh, embrace protectionism, demonization of immigrants, which we've seen, you know, not only in our own country, in uh, Brexit Britain, in Italy, even in Sweden, the supposed bastion of social democracy, where, you know, there's been this great upsurge of right-wing populism. People may be wrong to think that these are solutions to their economic problems, but they're not wrong to have concluded from their lived experience that the people running their economies don't really care very much about their basic needs and their ability to feed their families. Uh, that part, it turns out, is true. So, and, and 
By the way, we should pause and discuss uh, just-in-time manufacturing, which plays you know, another role uh, in terms of this shock to globalization. Just-in-time manufacturing, this concept pioneered by Toyota, very sensible idea. Instead of making as many cars as possible the way Ford did and shoving them through the distribution system and hoping someone will sell them, just make as many as people are actually buying, make as many to replace what you had unique to Japan's circumstances in, uh, po in the post-war period with uh, limited capital, not a lot of land for development. Well, along comes the consulting class like McKinsey working for the shareholder, and they turn this into a crude imperative to just slash inventory. Why spend money sticking extra parts in a warehouse against the possibility something will go wrong when you can give the money to yourself through executive compensation or give it back to the shareholder through dividends or buybacks? And the pandemic has really exposed the dangers of relying on this system where we have very lean inventory, we depend upon China to make everything, and we pretend that these container ships are just basically free. Um, and, and somebody actually put it to me that way. I was having a conversation about a year ago with the CEO of Columbia Sportswear. This is this giant sportswear company that's based in, in Oregon, who said, yeah, you know, as we were investing in China, we just assumed that we could treat shipping like, you know, it was going to be there forever and it was basically going to be free. And now we figured out that's not true anymore. And now we're trying to figure out what to do. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, the most profound uh, example of the shock that was delivered when we discovered that the Pacific Ocean's pretty big after all, uh, came, uh, I, I saw this up close when I went out to the Central Valley of California last year and visited with almond growers. It was the springtime, the, the, uh, the orchards were blooming and it's normally a wonderful time to be an almond farmer. You're looking around and seeing money literally growing on trees. And everybody I talked to had this deep sense of foreboding because they were still stuck with the previous year's crop because they couldn't get containers to stop at the port of Oakland uh, so they could load up their crop and ship it out. Their crop was actually sold. I mean, there were people waiting for their crop in Japan and Dubai, and they just simply couldn't get the ships to stop because it turns out the shipping industry, as they view it, is essentially run like a great big cartel. And the, the shipping carriers, there are about nine of them that dominate, that are actually divided into three alliances, sort of like the airline alliances. And together, they, they dominate 98% of the capacity for moving container vessels from the Pacific uh, across from Asia uh, to, to the West Coast of the United States. And these guys were making so much money uh, putting all of this stuff onto ships in China that Americans were buying. You know, we we're stuck in our homes. We can't go out to eat, so we buy a, a barbecue. Uh, we can't go on vacation, so we get our kids a video gaming console. All this stuff's getting loaded into container ships in ports in China. And uh, normally they unload the container and they then send it up to the Central Valley and they fill it up with almonds. Well, they were making so much money sending the stuff from China to the US, the cost of moving a container had skyrocketed from like 2000 bucks before the pandemic to close to $30,000 that they had no interest in helping out a bunch of almond farmers. They just put the empty containers right back on the ships. They sent them back to China to go get the next load. Uh, and this was, you know, another realization uh, that we were in a situation where we could simply, you know, no longer take uh, for granted uh, the availability of cheap shipping. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had geopolitics uh, widening the gulf between our country and China. Trump begins with across the board tariffs on Chinese imports. Biden continues uh, those tariffs and then uh, unleashes an offensive against the Chinese semiconductor industry to essentially contain China's technological prowess. Uh, of course, gives us these uh, subsidies on electric uh, vehicle manufacturing and, and batteries and an attempt to make sure that happens in the U.S. You know, Biden and Trump don't agree on much, but they seem to agree that uh, China is like an existential threat uh, to American livelihoods. And, and these two things, the pandemic disruptions to shipping and the serious trade war, have brought about the pivot that I think we're going to spend a lot of time this weekend discussing. And that pivot is multinational companies 
now looking for alternatives to just making their stuff in China. Uh, many companies are, of course, moving production from China to places like Vietnam. Vietnam's been a big beneficiary of this sort of investment. Uh, but a lot of people I talk to think that, uh, first of all, that's overplayed to a degree. Uh, a, a large multinational company I spoke to recently said, yeah, you know, we were doing that five years ago, and now we're lo actively looking for ways out of Vietnam. One, because guess what? Vietnam's still on the wrong side of the Pacific from our largest market in the United States. But also, you know, they're already reaching the point where it's difficult to find space. The ports are, are starting to get pretty crowded. So Vietnam may have taken us, you know, about as far as we can. Uh, countries like Cambodia that have gotten investment, uh, often Chinese companies managing factories and moving the operations to places like Cambodia. Same situation. Increasingly, there is a push by companies to set up manufacturing production closer to their biggest market. We're sitting in that market, it's the United States. They gotta be on this side of the Pacific Ocean. There's some talk of so-called reshoring, bringing production back to the States. I recently spent a couple of days out in California with a guy named Taylor Shoup, who had recently opened a factory to make socks just up the coast from San Diego. He was sort of a, uh, uh, an unlikely poster child for reshoring. Um, he had spent most of his adult life in China, figuring out how to make things in China. Uh, but he, you know, he'd studied Mandarin at 15. He, he'd helped launch a brand called Stance, these very fashionable socks that uh, were promoted by Rihanna and Will Smith and Jay-Z wrote a song about them. I mean, this, this, is, this is a guy who, who really understands marketing. Uh, but when he launched his own company in 2017, a company called Future Stitch, he, ex he first expanded his factory in China, and then he decided, no, I need to set something up uh, in the United States. And that was partially the stuff we've already talked about, the, the Trump, now Biden trade war. Uh, in part, it was uh, the reality that if you are making any apparel in China, you are exposed to the possibility that you are purchasing cotton uh, that's made uh, by forced labor uh, by the Uyghur, the repressed ethnic minority in Xinjiang. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration has actually accused China of genocide against the Uyghur people. And there are now sanctions. They haven't been fully implemented. Uh, but we're not supposed to be bringing anything into the United States uh, that uh, was made in Xinjiang. And, and anybody who's touching the supply chain for apparel in China runs the risk of, of, of a serious threat. Uh, to their uh, to their to their business, and you know, as as uh, as Taylor put it to me, you know, who wants to develop a supply chain in China now? And he was also cognizant. And this was the part that I really struck me that the China story, and this is a guy who's about you know storytelling around his products. The China story has become a branding liability. I mean, this is someone who understands that the value of Jay-Z writing a song about your socks is greater than any you know, advertising campaign you could possibly launch. And it's now a bad detail in the story to be tapping the China supply chain. So he's fashioning a new story. He's, he's hired a, a bunch of formerly incarcerated women who are working in his factory in Oceanside. They describe the experience as transformational. Uh, and, you know, you can buy this framing or you can just say this is a new, particularly sophisticated marketing pitch, whatever you like. But I, I would suggest that uh, this indicates that the value of making stuff in America has clearly been elevated if these kind of tastemakers have now come around uh, to the Made in America initiative. Some of this is overblown. Uh, I've been talking to the reshoring initiative, which puts out all of these reports about the hundreds of thousands of jobs that are supposedly coming back to the States. I recently contacted one of the companies that they tout as uh, their uh, success case of reshoring. It's an outfit in Austin, Texas called Vulcan. They make uh, electronic motorcycles and ATVs. And I talked to their CEO and he said, oh no, we're actually not making anything in the United States. In fact, all our e-bikes are made in China because it would cost us 6,000 bucks to make them in the United States. And our retail price point is 3,000 and no one's gonna pay 6,000 bucks for a bike. Asia's got everything. We're, we're there. We're trying to find suppliers in the States, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, clearly there is some marketing of reshoring uh, that has gotten out ahead of the reality. But that brings me to what I think is likely to be uh, a, a pretty significant part 
of the solution to our China-centric globalization problem, and that is Mexico, a place I've been spending a lot of time in the last couple of months. Mexican wages are not all that different from Chinese wages uh, in, in many respects. And if you factor in uh, the, the cost of shipping something, you can truck things from uh, Mexico to anywhere in the United States and get it there in less than two weeks compared to six to eight weeks, even in the best case scenario from China to the US. There, there's an awful lot of momentum now. There's a lot of investment going into Mexico. There's a lot of production me being moved uh, from China to Mexico. I, uh, I, the other night, I was down in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, which, of course, is Walmart's headquarters. And, you know, I, I was struck by how 20 years ago, if you were the representative of a uh, factory anywhere on Earth and you were pitching Walmart, trying to get Walmart to take your product and put it on their shelves, and you weren't making your good in China, there was a good chance Walmart wasn't interested because people referred to the China price. That was the lowest possible price. And if you weren't supplying that, then by definition, you weren't giving them the best price. Well, now, I, you know, I had dinner in Bentonville with a guy who uh, is in the process of moving some of his factories in China, first to Vietnam, but now it looks like to Mexico. And he said, if you go in and you pitch Walmart on a product and you're solely reliant on China, the meeting is over. They, they, are, they are simply not interested in the continued risk of uh, waiting for these container vessels. And you know, Walmart's big enough and powerful enough that they can actually uh, charter their own container vessels, but they still get stuck in these floating queues. So I went down to Mexico City and I visited with um, a family-owned apparel company north of Mexico City, a company called Preslo. And they told me over the years they'd made uh, uniforms for Walmart, you know, uniforms that people wear in the Walmart stores, they never made more than a few thousand in one shot. And suddenly in early 2022, Walmart calls them up and they want 50,000 of them in one shot, a million dollars worth. And this is clearly an indication uh, to this company, but I think to, to people around Mexico, that the map has been redrawn. And as, as a guy at that factory put it to me, you know, Walmart was having trouble with their supply chain, and they said, okay, Mexico, uh, save me. This, for those of us who are old enough to remember Ross Perot, is pretty ironic, right? I mean, 1992, Ross Perot, the Texas magnate, tells us that we should worry about the giant sucking sound, you know, these jobs going south to Mexico, and uh, uh, moreover, uh, labor unions in the states for years have told us that, that Mexico is the enemy of American middle class standards. Trump, of course, more recently has, has uh, uh, demonized Mexico. This is a place we're supposed to build a wall alongside because of all the terrible things supposedly coming into our country from Mexico. But the truth is that Mexico is legitimately a potential solution to our globalization problem. And the data bears this out. When we buy a good that's made in Mexico and we bring it into the United States, 40% of the value of that good typically is made in the United States because our supply chains are intertwined under this North American trade agreement. I mean, one of the great ironies of, of Trump uh, going after uh, China is that he's strengthened Mexico's economic appeal to American industry. By the way, the counterpart number, when we buy a Chinese good, a good made in China, brought here to the United States, roughly 4% of the value of that good, 40% versus 4% made in the United States, and Chinese state policy is to drive that number down as close to zero as possible. So we really are benefiting our own economy uh, when we trade with Mexico. And by the way, the clearest indication that Mexico makes sense as an alternative to China is the fact that Chinese companies are moving to Mexico and setting up factories there. I was recently in um, Nuevo Leon, which is a, a border state. Uh, the capital is Monterrey. It's this very futuristic city. It's about two hours drive from uh, the border town of Laredo. Uh, and I went to this industrial park where there are 28 different Chinese companies that have set up enormous factories. Uh, and they're there because they understand that this trade agreement that we have gives them the opportunity to make their products in Mexico, 
the products have a made in Mexico label. They can ship them up here to the US duty free. There are rules of origin in the trade agreement that uh, require that a certain percentage it varies from product to product uh, of the parts and raw materials have to be purchased in North America. Uh, and so, you know, I spent time with a big furniture company that makes Lazy Boy sofas. They just spent $300 million, or they're in the process of building that factory. Spent time with Hisense, which is a, a company that's making refrigerators and stoves uh, in, in this industrial park and shipping them up here. And interestingly to me, a lot of what's going on there uh, is happening because American companies are demanding that multinational companies that want to sell to them set up in North America. And this, this I, I should say, really has brought home that something real has happened. You know, you, I come back to what I was telling you at the beginning of the talk with the Dodge brothers and Ford. You know, in my gut, I am suspicious that once we get back to normal, uh, something different will transpire where a multinational company will spend real money to put resilience into the supply chain because the basic incentives of, uh, of the executive suites at publicly traded companies are much the same. You know, nobody cashes a big bonus check because they spent a huge amount of money this year and 10 years from now, something terrible happens. And thank goodness we had all those parts in the warehouse or we built the factory or we, you know, you get a bonus check for a great quarter right now. And that usually comes from cutting your costs. So I, I am you know, deeply suspicious of this idea that uh, this transition will really happen. And there are reasons to be suspicious. You, know, you go back to, um, to Fukushima, uh, the disaster in Japan, uh, and there was a lot of talk of shortages and we need more resilience. The first story I ever wrote about a shock to the global supply chain was in 1999 when there was an earthquake in Taiwan and people said all the same stuff. Maybe we shouldn't have all our eggs in that basket. And the eggs were smaller then. Uh, and, you know, the world kept going right on alone. I, uh, I stumbled on a quote from a book by the journalist Barry Lynn. Uh, our corporations have built a global production system that is so complex and geared so tightly and leveraged so finely that a breakdown anywhere increasingly means a breakdown everywhere. Our corporations have built the most efficient system of production the world has ever seen, perfectly calibrated to a world in which nothing bad ever happens, but that is not the world we live in. Not only is human civilization riven routinely by earthquakes and hurricanes, but so too it is shattered by wars and acts of terror and simple human error, which means it is only a matter of time un until we experience our next industrial crash, perhaps one much worse than any we have yet known. That book was published in 2005. That's six years before Fukushima. That's 15 years before the pandemic. And we didn't heed that warning. So my gut has said, yeah, you know, we'll get back to normal and we'll go back to making things in the cheapest possible place. But what I've learned in China I'm sorry, what I've learned in Mexico really challenges that assumption. And, and I'll, I'll leave you with this little story. When I was down in Monterey going to these industrial parks full of Chinese companies, uh, I, I heard this kind of story again and again. I, I, here's one version of it. I talked to a company called Li Zhong Wheel. This is the second largest maker of aluminum wheels in China. Huge player in the Chinese automotive market. They have been exporting to the states supplying GM and Ford, tier one supplier of, of these giant automotive companies. And GM and Ford said, if you want our business, you gotta be in North America. And so this company reluctantly, never had a factory in North America, is now building a big factory in Mexico to supply uh, GM and Ford, among other companies from Mexico. Something really is changing now. Uh, and again, globalization's not over. Trade is still an awfully good way for us to maximize the potential of modern society, though we have a lot of work to do to make sure that it, it actually benefits more people. But we are clearly now living in a different era of globalization than the one we've experienced for decades. Thank you very much. If it ultimately really isn't, as you imply, uh, 
in the executive suite, in the C-suite, in the boardrooms, it's not their problem to worry about resilience, right? I mean, right. then whose problem is it? It's probably the government's. So is that where industrial policy comes in and we start seeing the CHIPS Act? I mean, what, yeah. who then worries about resilience if not the companies? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, the market system brought us to this place where it was cheaper, more efficient to first make chips in Japan, eventually concentrate all these advanced uh, chips in Taiwan. That was allowing the market to do what it does, allowing the incentives that are in our market system to, to work. Uh, and if we think, and it's a reasonable thing to think, that there are national security imperatives uh, around advanced chip making, and we know that warfare itself is now a, a largely a technological exercise, uh, then it is a perfectly rational thing to, for the government to think about how are we going to make sure that we have this capacity uh, at home. And we can, we can change the incentives. I mean, once you uh, spend some money, and by the way, the amount of money that the government's talking about spending, it sounds really big, you know, $52 billion in incentives for these chips. One of these plants can cost $20 billion. <laughs> so it's really not that big a difference, but it's enough of a difference that if you don't avail yourself of the subsidies and set up a plant in North America, uh, you know, ideally in the United States, uh, well, your competitor will. And so the nature of the competitive marketplace has changed. Moreover, you've now created opportunities for other parts of the supply chain that feed the semiconductor industry to set up shop. I mean, I talked to a guy the other day from Schneider Electric, you know, this company that makes like the piece parts of the fuse boxes, you know, I mean, they're seeing this as a golden opportunity. So you're sort of priming the pump. And yes, it's, it's a rational moment to argue for industrial policy. So by the way, on that last point about Schneider, that's part of the problem, the challenge, I should say, about actually bringing the jobs to the, within the US borders, is having ecosystems that can support the manufacturing. In some cases, we've lost them. Right, right, that's true. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things that Americans used to know how to do that we just don't know how to do anymore. And it's gonna take a long time to build up the skills, the raw materials, and as, uh, as I guess Karen alluded to earlier, I mean, there are, there are also reasons to worry about the impact on our allies, especially Europe, uh, and faith in the rules-based trading system, uh, because you know, we can have a whole discussion around how, how Europe has reacted initially with pleasure that we're finally dealing with climate change in this country, and then with, uh, wait, hold on a second. So they're <laughs> gonna actually subsidize industry? Uh, and now there's a whole conversation in Europe around you know, tearing up their own regulations, prohibiting subsidies into their industries. So you know, it, it's, it's a new era. I mean, if we do industrial policy here, there's gonna be more industrial policy elsewhere, and we have to be prepared for that. So uh, we have people with numbers uh, who are going to bring a microphone to you. And uh, tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, Jim Matlack, live here in Camden. Uh, Peter, is Brexit and Britain leaving the common market in Europe an example of a failure of promise to go out on their own and, and somehow be better off economically? It looks like that was a really bad huh. choice. It, it looked like that from the beginning. I mean, it is, it, 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 it's what we can refer to as the most elaborate own goal in the history of football. Uh, it, it, look, it, 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 was a, it was never a serious idea. Um, it was an idea driven by two things. Uh, one, within the Conservative Party, uh, it was a way to conduct this long-running civil war. It was a, it was a Tory party uh, power struggle. Uh, and people who didn't really believe the things they were saying said a bunch of things to manipulate the electorate. And David Cameron, who uh, very foolishly called this referendum, uh, it has you know, acknowledged that he didn't even imagine for a moment that it was possible that, that Brexit would, would happen. This was a way to sort of lance the boil and get past this. Uh, beneath all this was a very cynical group of uh, hedge fund people who didn't like being under the yoke of uh, European financial regulations, uh, liked the idea of this swashbuckling future, which was code for... Uh, 
we get to dictate uh, what the rules are with the city of London, the financial services industry being at the center. And so all of this nonsense about, you know, taking back control and, and this kind of tribal response uh, to what in this country we're talking about, you know, in terms of the wokeness, uh, it was really about immigration, right? And getting people to fear uh, Syrian refugees coming in. And ultimately it was, um, a, quite frankly, raising the middle finger to the elites. And, and as, I, as I did some reporting in places like the north of England, de-industrialized, de uh, and, and talked to people about why they voted for Brexit, what I heard time and again was, well, we didn't really understand it. We didn't, uh, frankly, we didn't know what the European Union was. But what we knew was that the Conservative Party had screwed us for decades. And now uh, David Cameron and his sidekick, George Osborne, who had given uh, Britain 10 years of austerity, they were asking us to vote for this thing and whatever they were voting, asking for, we were gonna vote the other way. And so there was this kind of tribalist response and, and yes, it was going to be a disaster and it is a disaster because this is the first time in history the two powers have sat down to negotiate a trade deal that involves putting barriers into their trading relationship. Another question from the hall here? Numero uno, tell us. Hello, uh, Nick Mills from Rockland. Hey, Nick. So, uh, with all that you've said, whatever happened to this massive octopus that was going to swallow the earth? That is China's road and belt in initiative. Is that still an active component of China's policy? Yeah, that's that's a good question uh, and some something of a mystery. I mean, it certainly seems like the Belt and Road Initiative, which was this you know giant. Uh, initiative, you know, trillions of dollars uh, would be spent uh, extending power lines and building infrastructure around the globe. It, it was like, a, you know, it was everything in Chinese policy all crammed into one giant uh, spending endeavor. It was about getting China out from under having to have good relations with the American Navy to get access to raw materials in places like the Middle East and Africa. It was about creating lots of uh, jobs for Chinese construction workers. And there was a soft power dimension and that this was supposed to be uh, winning hearts and minds as Chinese companies would help build infrastructure in places like Africa. And then, of course, you know, famously, we've had all these examples of uh, debt disasters with uh, countries, especially in Africa, facing just terrible debts. Uh, Sri Lanka actually had to hand over a giant dam that was bankrolled by China to China. China now owns this piece of critical infrastructure that uh, Sri Lanka paid for. Uh, and at the same time, of course, China has been uh, dealing with the pandemic, uh, rising debt levels, a slowdown in growth, and suddenly isn't all that uh, wild about throwing trillions of dollars around. So it's certainly, as a talking point, been seriously de-emphasized. But, you know, it's, it, we should still anticipate that the blueprint for China is to extend its influence around the world, to take its largest, most strategically important companies uh, global, uh, and uh, to have there be some soft power dimension to this. And coming up on the Camden Conference 2023, more on the Belt and Road Initiative as our conference uh, continues. We'll have some expert comments from others on that as we go on. In the uh, other locations, be sure to be submitting your questions. I'll, we'll be able to see them up here, and you can participate just like anyone else. How about this side? We've had a, a left wing bias. Let's go to the right wing here. <laughs> Thank you. Bill Jones from Hope. Hope, Maine. Maine. Yep. Not Arkansas. Not Arkansas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Isn't it uh, naive to think that uh, all of the super uh, chip manufacturing capacity got into Taiwan because of the free market, when we know that the Taiwan government has a great sense, a great strategic sense, and has paid for it. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I, I take your point. I mean, it, look, I don't think there's any free market for just about anything anywhere. Uh, there's a mix of, of state intervention and uh, monopoly power and uh, various subsidies. I, I'm not saying this is some sort of pure reflection of the market, but in terms of our own side of that equation, in terms of what we buy and who we depend on for our suppliers, the existing incentives have produced a setup where our companies are largely dependent upon this one island, 90 some odd miles off the coast of China for advanced chips. And so the idea that that will be fixed by the market alone is naive. Uh, and that, that's the argument. And, and it's a complicated argument. There are reasons to be concerned about the implications of industrial policy, but that is the argument for the government uh, playing a very active role in uh, altering the circumstances so that we have a homegrown semiconductor industry. Sally Smith from Montpelier, Vermont. Can you elaborate on our own national vulnerability in terms of, of the lithium and other um, natural resources, our own vulnerability in terms of both trade and also the environmental movement? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, clearly, uh, lithium is going to be something that we're all going to talk about the way uh, we've gone through some centuries talking about oil. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's strategically important. We need it for batteries, among other things. We need, we need lithium for batteries for electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are the next great frontier of innovation, uh, manufacturing. I mean, this is clearly where the action is. I mean, I, I, I do, I'm struck by the fact that as I talk to um, friends who are in uh, the environmental activist world, there's a real split I, I, that I think you're putting your finger on. I mean, I know some people who say, well, this is just simply too destructive. We can't do it. And, and other people say, if we're going to transition to uh, clean energy uh, and we're going to get out of the existing framework, then we're going to have to get comfortable with mining and we're going to have to have a conversation about how to do it in a way that minimizes the environmental destruction and that maximizes our own access to what is a, a, a vital mineral. I mean, this is certainly an important conversation that we're just at the beginning of. Because people should know there's deposits in the U.S. Sure. It's just they would come at a cost. Right. I got a question for you, Peter. Sure. It's from earlier in your comments. Uh, in the 90s, I, uh, US trade, a former U.S. trade rep came into the studio, and uh, I think he was one of Reagan's trade reps. And I said, you know, what about the losers of globalization? And he said, well, we're going to have to pay for retraining. What is the problem with retraining? I mean, the government figuring it out. We are terrible at it. We're terrible it. at it. And it's not just the cost. There's something, it, it seems as if it is a problem that may not be easily solved, but that we could invest more in. We haven't tried it. Uh, I mean, there are not many countries that do it really well, but there are some, and the Nordics are very good at it. Mm. I mean, when you travel around the Nordics, what you hear time and again from, from governments is, we don't protect jobs, but we protect workers. And uh, as a result, uh, there's, there's actually more entrepreneurialism. I mean, we love to talk about Schumpeter and creative destruction, and we like to pretend that we're doing real capitalism in America, and that's nanny state socialism in Europe. You know, I remember uh, a few years ago, I went to this, this mine in Sweden, and um, they were testing self-driving trucks, and I went around talking to the people working at this mining operation to ask them how they felt about this. And conditioned as an American to hear, oh, this is terrible, this is threatening our job. And they all said, oh, no, we're, we're fine with it. Uh, because um, if, uh, if this works, it'll make the company more competitive and they'll be more profitable. And if they're more profitable, then we'll get uh, higher wages, which was not some sort of like faith-based uh, sentiment. This was based on their lived experience. They lived in a place where there were strong labor unions. They sat opposite the table with employers association and they hashed out wage structure that reflected productivity gains and translated them to workers through higher wages. And then they said, if we lose our jobs, they'll train us for something else because they lived in a society where taxes are much higher than they are here, where they tax wealthy people much more than we do here. And they invested things like 
job training. Here, we're very good at the sort of front end of the reform. Like, I mean, not to pick on Bill Clinton repeatedly, but you, you think about, you know, signing the welfare reform bill uh, back in 95, which imposed term limits on people receiving cash assistance. And there was a lot of talk of, well, what will happen to single moms? And, you know, this is during the dot-com bubble, and there's lots of jobs. What will happen when there aren't so many jobs? Oh, we're going to have, you know, subsidized child care. Well, that never happened. Uh, just like we got NAFTA, we got China entering the WTO. These things were great for, for the shareholder class. And I would argue great for society writ large if we had actually implemented the policies that distributed the gains equitably, but we just turned our backs on the consequences for the people who, who got hit. This is, this is a unique problem in our country. Questions? Uh, this is here, and then we're going to come, and then uh, volunteer two, I got gotcha, you, and then volunteer one. There'll be one up here in just a bit. Uh, Samuel from UMaine. I heard you talking about companies moving from China and then relocate to Mexico. Uh, so I wanted to ask if the Mexican population have the skill sets needed to feed these companies. That's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so Nuevo León, which is where 50% of the foreign direct investment uh, that went into Mexico last year is going, has um, a university called uh, Tech de Monterrey, which is known as the MIT of Mexico. They're churning out a lot of engineering graduates. The workforce is uh, pretty solid, and they've got the capacity to train people. Uh, other places, not so much, and it will... It will be, you know, a long process. It's not something you could just flip a switch on. But honestly, the same can be said about our own country. I mean, obviously, we have unbelievable uh, research capacities, innovation capacities, but spread very unevenly. I mean, we haven't done a good job of using community colleges and associate degrees, uh, the apprentice system that's been very successful in places like Germany. Uh, to put ourselves in a position to get back to doing some of the basic manufacturing that will go along with the advanced manufacturing. They both have to be there for this to work. So skills, you know, that's another long-term conversation. Thank you for that question. Thanks for all the questions. Is there one here? Yeah, there we go. I thought there was one there. Hi. Hi, I'm Kurt Whistler Lowe from Salt Lake City. This is practically it's a very similar question, but I thought of it before. Is Mexico stable enough? Does it function well enough to have all these factories there? Well, I mean, that's an excellent question. Mexico has its own challenges, right? So certainly security along the border uh, is an issue. Uh, Nuevo León has done really well getting all this investment, in part because it's perceived, fairly or not, as a more secure place where the state government has invested a lot of time and troops, essentially, to, uh, to keeping it more secure. But they, they still have some security problems. Uh, there are parts of Mexico that are largely uh, no-go. There are parts of Mexico that feel uh, quite stable. But, you know, I mean, let's look at the situation in China, which has traditionally been enormously stable under a one one party state. But I, I didn't even talk about this in my talk, which now I'm remiss now that you've asked this good question. Uh, think about zero COVID. I mean, a multinational company that's trying to figure out uh, what's the policy here? OK, let's see. First, uh, you have the Wuhan outbreak and you covered it up the same way you did with SARS. Then you got really serious about it. You stamped it out. You locked everybody down. Oh, then we had labor shortages because workers went home for the Lunar New Year in 2020. They never came back because of the pandemic. You know, then everybody's in lockdown. You have one case at a single giant container port. It's shut down. You can't move anything. And now, oh, everything's open. Uh, let's just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to it after these extraordinary protests. So I'm not comparing China to Mexico. They're different issues, but they're, there's variability there. Uh, there. There are certainly uh, difficulties in understanding what the future will hold. I, I mean, that's a long-winded way of saying there is now clearly greater risk in China to concentrating your, your focus there. So as a result, Companies are inclined to take on the risks that are in Mexico, and they are there in exchange for the benefit of being on the same side of the Pacific as the largest economy on Earth. Peter, we have a remote question. 
And let this be an example to other people who are in remote locations. It really does trickle through, so we'd love to hear yours. Uh, it's from Meg Tui in Salem, Massachusetts. What impact Great will question. the movement of manufacturing to Mexico have on migration to the US? Great, great question, important question. You know, years ago, I went to Guadalajara. I was doing some reporting on NAFTA and how it played for uh, Mexico. And I remember talking to a sociologist there who said, you have to understand, Mexicans don't leave Mexico and go over the border to live the American dream. They go there to live the Mexican dream. They, they, you know, they're aware that it's not great fun to pile into a two bedroom apartment with eight other guys and stand on a street corner hoping to get a construction job uh, and worrying about getting robbed uh, and being far away from their families. If there are good jobs at home, uh, people will stay. Uh, and, and honestly, if there were less militarization along the border, people would probably go back and forth more seasonally than they do. So there's good reason to think that if Mexico develops, and uh, gets uh, more middle-class jobs, that will have an impact on, on migration and more people will stay put, including people leaving Central American countries, mm -hmm. making their way through Mexico en route to the US. Thank you for your comments. My name's Vera Trojan, I'm from Boston. Um, one of the drivers of globalization is the need for capacity uh, and not just efficiency. Uh, the unemployment rate in the United States is his at historical lows. The population of China is declining. Could you comment as you look forward for the next decade, for example, how this need for capacity, whether it's labor or otherwise, will drive globalization and the necessity to have globalization continue? You're, you're asking about demographics in terms of the, the driver for the kind of globalization that we have? Well, that's an important element of capacity, yes. What, what do you mean by capacity? The capacity to produce. Yeah. And so, yes, demographics are an important part of that. I mean, trade is fundamentally about doing what you do well and exchanging your goods and services with other powers that do what they do well. And uh, that should, uh, classical economics theory tells us, you know, work out to net benefit. China has obviously challenged our understanding of classical economics in that regard. But I, I mean, I think that same basic uh, reality holds and 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 I, I don't think it's an oversimplification to say like if we didn't have the most basic form of trade none of us would be here tonight you know we'd be out fishing and you know scraping bark off trees to feed our families like we wouldn't have the clothes on our backs right we unless we were home making them so i mean that fundamental uh truth about modern society uh will will hold and uh people will not just simply sit in uh, circumstances where they could obviously better themselves by exchanging with, with, with other, other people. I'm not sure I've answered your question, uh, but that, that's, that's the basis of my just fundamental belief that globalization is not going away. It, it, it will change, it will be more regional, uh, we'll think more about resilience, and that could play all sorts of different ways. And, and, there, and there will be, an upsurge, I mean, we are living in a time when there's an upsurge of nationalism, right? We saw it uh, during, in the first part of the pandemic in terms of access to PPE, in terms of the raw materials needed for vaccines. Uh, we are certainly seeing it in terms of industrial policy. Um, I don't wanna uh, steal ideas from other people sitting in the audience, but somebody who's gonna speak tomorrow made the point to me that, uh, you know, the Europeans may, may take our own industrial policy as an opportunity to tear up their own uh, bans on uh, subsidies uh, because uh, there are interests that benefit from that. So that will be a complicating factor, but, but the fundamental drivers of globalization will remain. On this side, volunteer three, do you, did you spot someone? Hi, tell us your name. Hello, um, Mr. Goodman, and thank you, Mr. Brown Classio. Um, I'm Alan. Uh, my, my name is Alan Chang from Taiwan. I'm also one of the student body of uh, Graduate School of School Policy and International Affairs from UMaine. So I really like the comparison that you led from the September 21st uh, earthquake in Taiwan 
and then how this led to the globalization and then mentioned that not all the eggs should be put in the same basket. And at that time I was probably like seven, like living on the, hmm. one of the, uh, the, one of the most beautiful like grassland over there, but it, because it was the earthquake and so we have to be put on the street for like probably a week mm. and then receive a lot of like global aids uh, at the time. Mm. But then with this comparison back to the, now the trade war with China and then uh, the deglobalization that all the TSMC technology now has to be uh, somehow like we at the society back then, we were worried about the core technology that would be transferred over. But as I read more, I realized that um, if this kind of cooperation that we can make sure the, the core technology in TSMC can be uh, reinforced in the US, um, the security that we will be able to um, have U.S. insured Taiwan could probably also be enforced, like be uh, improved, as um, a lot of us in Taiwan know that TSMC uh, still like has taken up a lot of the production and the uh, the supply for the chips and the Chinese chips. Uh, one the the largest Chinese chips company called Zhongxin. Uh, within its domestic supply only takes up to 10% at most right now. So TSMC's core technology is really, really that important. And now we are like um, setting up and investing again in the U.S. And I would like to know uh, what do you think about this kind of security and this uh, agreement of the trade? TSMC is a huge footprint in the chip making world. It doesn't have a huge brand. Uh, recognition in the U.S. It's a massive Taiwan-based chip maker, sure. right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're asking about uh, the incentive for TSMC to set up in in the U.S. and whether that's positive for national security? Uh, or the security of uh, Taiwan wide, because uh, we actually rely a lot on the TSMC production that makes sure that uh, the I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm no expert in the semiconductor industry. I assume that if TSMC is prepared to spend, you know, what are they talking about, $100 billion in Phoenix over uh, a decade, uh, they're giving some thought to security. And uh, uh, the nature of the relationship between Taiwan and, and, and the United States is, is such that uh, this, this is the whole, the whole point, right, is, is to keep... Uh, especially advanced lithography uh, technology that's available uh, primarily from, from the Dutch uh, and, and the Japanese out of the hands of Chinese companies that are trying to climb up the value chain in terms of semiconductors. So I assume building a plan in the U.S. is, is very much consistent with that. We've got a remote question from Nashra, University of Maine. She points out that we've been talking quite a bit about supply chain disruption. Uh, forcing this pivot that you've been talking about, Peter. But um, let's talk a little bit more about the role of politics, national yeah. politics. I mean, that's part of it, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and politics is a driver. Uh, I mean, Trump, of course, uh, act, actually called on American companies to abandon China. Uh, this was the beginning of, of discussing China openly as, as an enemy. Uh, the result of that was not particularly beneficial to U.S. communities. I mean, a lot of investment did leave China, but it mostly went to places like Vietnam and Bangladesh and Cambodia and, and to, to a lesser extent. Uh, but certainly uh, the issue of, of where companies are incentivized to produce uh, and, and this, by the way, was, was part of what I was trying to get at when I told you the story of Future Stitch, this company in San Diego, that this is a company run by a guy who's a creature of the fashion world. I mean, he's, he's dealing with uh, values and sentiments, and those, those sentiments are shaped by politics. And he's concluding that, you know, I don't particularly want my brand aligned with uh, the Uyghur uh, forced labor supply chain, and that dovetails with the American political imperative to bring supply chains uh, out, out of China. So there's a combination of kind of 
cultural perception factors, political sentiments, actual geopolitical imperatives like the issue of, of chips, pharmaceutical capacity, uh, and uh, electric uh, vehicle manufacturing that will continue to regionalize our, our supply chains. I, I, I think that's the, the logical outcome of all of those factors interacting. Question over here. There's one in the far back, I can see, but did you spot one in, in the front? Oh, wait. Uh, well, he, start here, and then we'll go far back. You see him? It's uh, right in there. Yes, sir, tell us your name. Uh, my name is Dutch Treat. I'm from Belmont, Massachusetts. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not sure that this actually matters in, uh, in terms of global trade, but I've been reading articles recently about the use of the Chinese yuan as a reserve currency in trade and an increasing amount of trade. Does it matter um, as uh, global trade progresses that there may be two functional reserve currencies in the world, the U.S. and China? Um, it would matter. Uh, count me uh, very skeptical of the idea that the yuan will be a global reserve currency anytime soon. Clearly, there are growing volumes, I mean, for the simple reason that China is a larger and larger trade power. Uh, but the simple fact is that uh, capital controls remain in place. Uh, China is now reluctant uh, to uh, engage in more and more debt. I mean, you know, part of the reason why the U.S. is the global reserve currency is because we'll just keep printing dollars and selling bonds to all all comers, uh, you know, part of the reason why the euro hasn't been uh, adopted as more of a reserve currency, despite, you know, endless predictions that that was inevitable for years and years, is because Germany doesn't want to go into debt. And if you're not going to go into debt, then you don't have anything to sell. And if you don't have anything to sell, there's no, there, there's no trading in, in, in your currency. I mean, the, the U.S. is the ultimate liquid market. Now, I think we're, we're all um, uh, in peril if we look at how things are and just predict that that's how things will be going forward forever. Uh, we're certainly living in a bad time to live uh, that way. But, I mean, currency requires confidence. And there are reasons to doubt. I mean, here we are having this, yet again, another absurd debate over lifting the debt ceiling. Uh, but, you know, it's just an existential truth that people who hold the U.S. dollar assume that they are holding something that is a true store of value. We could debase it various ways. We could talk about that. Uh, but it's, it, it's something real. And we're just nowhere near that in terms of holding the renminbi. I mean, we have seen uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the Chinese Communist Party prioritize lots of other things besides uh, faith in uh, the economic system, the rationality of regulations. They're dealing with a whole lot of other factors besides, you know, maximizing confidence in their in their economic system. And that's that's a major reason to, to, that will prevent uh, the renminbi from becoming the reserve currency anytime soon. And our status as reserve currency uh, brings huge benefits that only this country gets from that. It's not just like the dollar being higher or lower. It's like a, a big deal. Was there a question in the back? Um, thanks. I'm, I'm Seth Singleton from, uh, from Mount Desert. You started with Henry Ford. Yeah. And the idea that maximizing short-term profit for the benefit of investors was a problem. Yep. You then went on to China to Mexico and industrial policy. I want to go back to the beginning. Do you see any signs that in the boardrooms, the mentality of maximizing profit for short-term in investment or for short-term profit for the benefit of investors is changing? That's a great question. Uh, I mostly see more and more sophisticated ways for the boardrooms to convince us that that's changing <laughs> while reinforcing the status quo. Uh, <laughs> well, come on, man. You saw that uh, business roundtable pledge three years ago? I wrote about at great length the business <laughs> roundtable pledge in my last book, uh, Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. 
uh, and looked at how the signers of that pledge, this is a pledge for those of you who are not uh, aware, uh, that says we, we no longer live in the age of Milton Friedman and shareholder maximization. We now live in this great era of stakeholder capitalism where uh, it's not just about shareholders, it's about stakeholders. That includes uh, labor, never labor unions, but labor, they're very careful about that. It's a unilateral kind of thing. Uh, local communities, uh, Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce, uh, once wonderfully said that uh, the planet is a stakeholder, which is wonderful news for those of us who live on the planet. I mean, the, the people who signed this pledge, there were 180 CEOs. Uh, who signed this business roundtable stakeholder capitalism? They included uh, Jeff Bezos, who uh, somehow uh, managed to not uh, sort the everything store uh, overseer couldn't find PPE for his warehouse workers, though they seemed to be able to find it to put it in boxes for the people who would pay for it. Uh, included Albert Borla, the CEO of Pfizer, who again did a magnificent job capitalizing on publicly financed research to bring us these life-saving vaccines in record time, but then made a lot of pledges about you know, vaccine equity around the world. And we've come through a period where frontline medical workers in Pakistan are treating COVID patients without any protection while we're giving doses to kids in countries where we're fortunate enough to have governments that can pay whatever Albert Borla would like us to pay for Pfizer. So, no, I don't see significant changes. What I see uh, is fear uh, based on this global shock, uh, fear that you could get crosswise with the U.S. government, uh, you could upset your uh, consumers, uh, you, could, uh, you could run out of stuff uh, in a way that would hit your bottom line right this quarter. Uh, and so... The shock has been so comprehensive that there is now a real conversation about resilience that I've found pretty surprising. But yeah, those incentives are still a problem. A great place to end our first session this evening. Peter Goodman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Great question. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. That was great. Man. You were great. Oh, you were great.